I'm pleased to be here. So ladies, gentlemen, real estate industry professionals, those of you who are here only because you need MCLE credits, welcome. It is my honor today um, to be with Peter Lowy. Um, I'm as honored as I am unqualified to be here. Uh, Peter is one of Los Angeles's great philanthropists as well as uh, one of the global leaders in real estate. He is uh, a great friend of UCLA. Last uh, June, uh, Peter gave us the uh, pleasure of uh, his remarks during the MBA graduation. And uh, for many years, I've known Peter as a panelist at the Milken Institute, uh, where he has been uh, gracious enough to share his insights about global real estate for many years. Uh, and many of you may say, Lou, you know, even with your accomplishments as the non-international uh, leader of Goodwin Proctor, uh, how can you be up here with a man like, uh, like Peter Lowy? And uh, I just want to tell you that uh, the reason I'm up here is because my grandfather once told me some very interesting uh, advice. Uh, he said, Lou, always be doing something interesting in case you die in the middle of it. So this is why I'm here. Peter, let's begin. Um, you're known and respected for your 30-year career in the uh, retail shopping center space and as a leader in the real estate investment trust area. You serve as co-CEO of the Westfield Group, which has over 100 centers uh, around the world. Uh, you have a valuation of your uh, company at more than $64 billion. You're on the, governor, uh, the governor's board for NAREIT. You're the current uh, chairman of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. You're on the RAND Corporation Executive Committee and its Board of Trustees. Uh, I'm sure someone is spying on us as a result right now. Uh, you serve on the Executive Committee of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and as a director of uh, the Lowy Institute for International Policy, as well as uh, chairman of the American Jewish University. And, uh, in June of thir uh, 2013, as I mentioned, you uh, spoke for the UCLA Anderson School of Management. You're married to an amazing woman, four marvelous children. You have a great extended family here in the United States, Australia, Europe. You're handsome, rich, talented, generous, and Jewish. Were you not married, you'd be clearly the most popular guy on J-Date. <laughs> and by the way, do you like pina coladas and taking walks in the rain? First, I've got to give him 20 bucks for okay, that. Okay, thank you very much. There you there go. You go. Um, <laughs> no, I drink scotch, oh, actually. Yeah, is drink that right? Whiskey. Scotch, okay. I'll, I'll change your J-Date profile. <laughs> um, in many respects, this is... Give me 20 is, bucks back. Oh, that was I'm a sorry. joke. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Not, not <laughs> In many respects, you know. Typical you, lawyer, he took the 20 bucks and put it in his pocket. No, it's a retainer. Um, in many respects, this is the perfect audience to hear your views. Our attendees comprise the, uh, uh, some of the past, present, and future of the real estate industry. And uh, we also have students, both law students and business students here. So before we delve into your, uh, your views on real estate in particular, I'd like to begin by delving into your personal history a bit, because I think this is um, where we have, I get an hour with you, and I never get to do that. You're normally on a panel with other people. <coughs> and uh, I want to know what makes you tick. Um, so the first thing, I, I, let's just do a couple of icebreakers, OK? Cool. You and me? OK, first. Right. What's your favorite animal? Oh, a favorite animal? Jeez. Okay. Uh, do I get to pass? You can pass on that. We'll get to that later. OK. All right, whatever Favorite it was, it was animal. correct. Oh, um, I tell you, I've been doing this 30 years. I never got asked that question. I, well, you know, I'm, I'm Not even on J-Date did I get asked really, that question. Really? You never got that? You never no, put it on? No. Um, being Australian, have you ever tied a kangaroo down? Ah, there you go. Kangaroo. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Okay. No. no, okay. No, I never right. tied a kangaroo down. Okay, I don't think you can. No. Third question. Hanukkah and Thanksgiving occur on the same night this year, mm. right? The first night? Yeah. Um, and that won't happen for 70,000 years? Apparently okay. not. First time since 1888, apparently. Yeah, long time, yeah. So what special food combinations are you looking forward to? You know, that's really interesting because I was just reading in the New York Times yesterday that Manischewitz, Mano Manischewitz, mm -hmm. has a whole range of uh, advertising and products that they've brought out for thanks. Ganaka? Yeah, thanks Ganaka. Thanks Ganaka. Like, thank, yeah, thanks everything's Ganaka. tosher. Yeah, on thanks Ganaka. Like 
thanks, Galka. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be uh, eating the turkey and smelling the latkes. Don't forget to play spin the drumstick. Spin the, yeah. I don't know what they're going to do. They had a special yeah. dreidel they designed yeah, for it. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so let's let's go to the um, the next uh, non icebreaker. Let's talk about some serious things. <laughs> let's talk about your let's talk there about your go. family. Um, I don't know if anybody can flip these slides around. Can someone flip the slides? Or is that uh, me? Bo, can you help? Okay. Well, let's uh, thank you. Um, so your your parents, uh, Frank, and your mother, Shirley, uh, have an incredible story. Um, your father was born in what's now the Czech Republic. He moved to Hungary as a child. He lived in Israel. He fought in the war uh, for liberation. And arriving in Australia in 1952, he spoke no English and had relatively little money. Thank you. Um, can you tell us what Frank Actually, had to endure? he had no money. He had no money. No money. Yeah, nothing. No so money. what did he have to endure to get to Sydney? And how did he meet your mother? And what was it like growing up in the Lowy household? Wow. How long do we have? couple of minutes, I'm going to cut you off. You know, I don't spend this much time with my analyst I know, talking okay. like this. It's all right. You can lie down. We yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, look, I think, I think the way my dad wrote a book, it's, it's quite public in Australia. Um, and and it's, it's sort of, it's an incredible success story. But it's a success story that's born of the country. That's very similar to what you had in the US with uh, immigrants. And, you know, with things like the immigration bill going on right now, um, when you come from a house like mine, I cannot imagine why a country like ours would not encourage immigration, would not encourage innovation, would not encourage people to come to countries like Australia and the US, where the system allows you to come from nowhere, have nothing, but through sheer hard work, innovation, um, and, and brains and desire, create um, incredible, uh, not just incredible, but create something from nothing whether it be a small business where you have one store or you employ five people, to a business that my father uh, created that we helped create, but that the country and the public markets allowed us to create. So he started, um, he got to Australia in 1952, could speak no uh, English. Um, there was a small Hungarian community there that had emigrated after the war, and he actually started uh, driving a truck delivering meats to delicatessens. And he figured out how to be the lead salesman, and he figured out how to get those orders early. You know, he'd get up at five in the morning, beat everybody else there, had an incredibly strong work ethic. Uh, he met uh, another Hungarian gentleman who had quite a successful uh, sandwich shop, basically, in a railway station uh, in the city um, downtown, and together they opened up a uh, uh, delicatessen out in the suburbs where all the immigrants were working, because that's where the, you talk about the housing stock now. Sydney and, and Australia grew with immigrants who were moving to the outer suburbs, um, and there was a big boom in housing, and all of the construction workers were, were Eastern European immigrants. So they did things like bring in the first espresso machine ever in the country. Hard to imagine what Australia was like uh, in the 50s. It was very English. No offence to any Englishman in the, in the room. Um, and, and to do things like that. And then they were just two entrepreneurs. Um, they bought the land next door to build a coffee shop, then they used that to buy some land. And actually, my father and his partner did a trip in 1958 to California. Hmm. And they wanted to go in the real estate business, and they rented a car, and they drove up and down the California coast. And they couldn't decide whether they were going to go into the, uh, into the housing business, you know, where you would buy land, subdivide it, get, uh, get approvals, and then sell them off um, to uh, housing builders or into the uh, roadside motel business, because you know, even though the freeways were being built, people were still taking Highway 1. Or they should go into the mall business. And in fact, they brought an architect with them. They stopped at all these motels along the highway and, and measured out the rooms. In the end, they decided to go into the mall business. They bought a block of land. They got a department store and, and built a department store in 10 shops. It was actually, the department store was 20,000 feet. Uh, and 10 shops. Um, and through a whole range of things, um, in Australia to grow, you couldn't get non-recourse financing. It didn't exist. So the only way you could grow a business if you had a number of smaller developments was to either build them and sell them, or if you wanted to own them, you had to actually go public. So um, the markets were very different than they are today, whereas entrepreneurs could actually go public. There was capital available for them. 
the institutions didn't actually rule the market and entrepreneurs could actually raise money, make huge returns, or lose it. Funny thing that when you risk money, you can actually lose it, something we've sort of forgotten about um, today. And uh, they actually took a company public in 1960. My father and his partner were two, they had only been in the country eight years, um, two young immigrants. My dad was 30 years old, his partner was 35 years old. And through a small brokerage house, they, they did a, uh, a limited public offering. And the company grew. And, and as it turned out, the company is the most successful company in the country. Had you bought $1,000 worth of stock in the original float in 1960, be worth $180 million today. Um, it, it, it's, it's sort of uh, Warren Buffett style yeah. returns. But, but while that's an incredible number, the issue for them was that we had a country and a system that allowed people to invest, take risk, get return. Um, you had a growing population that was moving out to the suburbs. Um, you had the ability of retailers who were looking to go out to the suburbs. And while the company had, had, had some issues, uh, every time there was a credit crunch, they had problems just like everybody else today. Um, but through sheer hard work, they could create this incredible company. And today, as you said, we control some uh, $68 billion worth of assets in, uh, in the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we're expanding, we're building in Italy, and we have an incredibly sophisticated company. Amazing. So, uh, uh, and as my dad says, he didn't do it on his own, but he certainly drove it. He certainly drove it. And he has this sort of, um, you hear all these sayings all the time about, uh, about um, uh, success is a journey, not a destination. But my dad has a different thing. He, his, his issue is he always climbs up the hill. And all that you ever do is when you get to the top of the hill, you get to the next hill. Which means you never actually get to the top of the hill. It doesn't mean you always expand. It doesn't mean you always keep buying. It doesn't mean you always grow. But, but without an education, he had an incredibly sophisticated uh, mind. He's incredibly sophisticated um, financially and legally. Um, and he learned from some very good people on the way who helped out. So, wow. so he had a team of people, and, and it, it's just an incredible story. With a story like that, I hate to follow it up, but who, who else um, influences you uh, in your life? Who's been uh, someone of moment in your life that, who affected you? You know, most of, um, I will give a plug to the second generation though, to my brothers and I, actually, um, before I ask that question, because while the company grew to a certain point, um, I came to work in 1983, my elder brother started working there in 1980, and my younger brother started working in uh, 86. The, the equity market capitalization of the company in 1983 was around, uh, $250 million. Today, the equity value of the group together is some $35 billion. So when you look at the growth of the company, it went from zero to $300 million between 1960 and 1985. And then in the uh, 28 years since then, it went from $350 million to $35 billion. So the ability to grow really came, uh, and, and the real growth of the company, really came when it went out of, the, out of Australia and, uh, and came to the US, and, and its growth has been exponential since then. Uh, for my own career, er everything I've done has been in partnership. Um, and I get that from my dad too, but you know, obviously with my wife, we, we run a partnership at home, although I'm the junior partner there. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I learned from all you guys. I was at a, I was at a function once, and I could never actually, uh, I love stories. I could never actually explain this. And, and everyone went around the table at a function and everyone said, I'm the senior partner at this law firm. I'm the chairman at this law firm. I'm the junior partner at this law firm. And when it came to me, I said, my wife's the senior partner and I'm the junior partner. Um, and so I sort of figured out from the legal guys. But, but everything I've done is, uh, is in partnership. Um, uh, when I first came to the US, I, I don't know if you remember Rich Green, um, we had a very small company. I came here in 1990, we had six smalls. We went through the 91 to 94 recession. Um, we actually cut the staff in half. We sold a bunch of the centers and we were able to bring equity from Australia to grow. But he and I started um, you know, in partnership together. Um, I've been in partnership with my father and brothers um, uh, ever since. So everything I've actually done is in partnership. So you learn from the people you work with. 
You touched on globalization of real estate, and uh, why did Westfield move out of Australia? Uh, was it growth for growth's sake? Was it an, an understanding of changing dynamics in the world? Was it climbing that next hill? Uh, uh, why, cl why did you climb that next yeah, hill? Yeah, what happens is when you, when you get when, when you start a business in a, in a much smaller market, you get this from Canadian companies, you get this from Australian companies. We have a very limited marketplace. Um, when the company was uh, growing, Australia had 12 million people. Today it has 20 million people. Uh, we bought our first mall here in the US in 1977 in Trumbull, Connecticut, which was a hell of a long way from Sydney. By the way, there were no... Uh, uh, that's a good photo. Yeah, your, there were no, that's your favourite uh, animal, by the way. There were no... Uh, uh, direct flights to uh, LA, you used to go Sydney, Honolulu, Honolulu, LA, LA, New York, then you get in the Connecticut shuttle, which was a bus, <laughs> and drive two and a half hours up, up to Connecticut. So um, it was a long way away, but the problem you have is, is we were getting quite large in our own market and there was nowhere else to go. There was large amounts of capital available, so uh, um, when you're looking to expand, you look to the biggest, best, strongest market you can find. So we decided to come here. But, but my dad did a really interesting thing, which we've followed since then, in that while the company was a reasonable size at the time, they bought one mall in Connecticut. And the chief executive of the company took his time to travel, which I said was a really long way, um, and spent a ton of time at that one asset and understand the market. My elder brother came here for a couple of years. So by the time we started expanding in the US, it wasn't as if you had a large company coming here and buying a huge amount of assets. We actually made a small investment and then took a long number of years to, uh, to understand the market. I, I came here in 1990, so we, we bought our first mall in 1977. We did a, a $350 million deal. We bought a couple of assets in 1986, and then we did a billion dollar deal in 1994. Hmm. We'd been here 17 years. We understood the market. We developed, we knew what we were doing. And so we resist the pressure to just invest for investment's sake and just grow for growth's sake. Great. The, the interesting thing is, though, we thought Australia was ex-growth at the time. And the size of the company has more than doubled since we left Australia within Australia. Hmm. Well, so the Australian uh, uh, population grew from 12 million to 20 million people. And our business actually more than doubled in Australia. Well, you have, as I understand it, 70% of the population of the state or of, of the nation is within a 20-minute ride of a Westfield Mall. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's uh, pretty good penetration. Yeah, I would, I'd say so. Let's talk about the um, the current political and economic environment as it applies to to real estate and otherwise. Um, according to uh, Stuart Gabriel and others, you know, you're looking at household debt being down. The housing retrenchment's nearly complete. Multifamily seems to be very, very hot. Um, but the rest of the world is also improving. We've got corporate profits that are relatively high, and, uh, and we have surprises to the upside. We've got North America contributing to the other Americas and making us energy independent. There are lots of different trends. Um, and it looks like we're about a year away from, uh, from truly ending tapering based on what's going on in, in Washington. Um, so, you know, I love it when lawyers give economic predictions. Uh, I'm not giving a prediction. I'm just letting you know. I'm, 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 actually, these are your words. I'm just repeating. <laughs> oh, is that mine? Yeah, is that, is that what I said? Yeah. Um, I've had the guys from the Zyman Center give us the predictions. Yes, that's right. There you go. Um, and, and we see now there's more regulatory um, uh, scrutiny of mm -hmm. Wall Street. And, uh, and yet state and local governments are continuing to struggle, including California. So, uh, in fact, uh, in Detroit, I don't know if you saw the, um, uh, the former mayor um, has been convicted of racketeering and extortion charges, and so um, his penalty is he has to continue to serve as the mayor of Detroit. <laughs> um, Peter, uh, with all of this going on, uh, from a national perspective, how would you rate Obama so far in his second term? Oh, there's a lead in for you, isn't it? Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to comment just on the president. I think, I think I'll put it this way, especially since we're taping this. Um, I, I've been working for uh, over 30 years. I've worked in England, I've worked in Australia, I've worked here in the US, I've been in London and New York, Sydney and Los Angeles. Um, in my career, I have never seen government affect what, we've, what we do as much as now. 
just, just never been. I mean, we, we, you always deal with tax policy. You always deal with economic policy. We go through recessions. We went through the 91 to 94 real estate recession, which you know, killed almost everybody. Um, and while they are affected by government policies, they are actually created by business. Um, now, it, it's just, there's a, just a shift. There's been a shift away from private enterprise towards government and bureaucracy. And, uh, and with the dysfunction in, in most governments, actually, we have it here in, it's a little better in Sacramento, but we have it here, they have it in, um, in Albany, we have it in Washington. Um, you know, you see minority governments in most of the democracies around the world. I would argue we, we have a, well, a bit, more, bit better now, but we had a minority government here, they had one in England, they had one in Australia. Um, it's become very difficult to do business. And the government is actually affecting the economy much, much more than uh, I've ever seen. Um, I think the key for us is what I'd like to see and what, what I spent a bunch of time in Washington doing this, especially on things like tax policy and economic policy, is I almost, almost don't care what the policy is. I just almost don't care what the tax policy is. What I'd like to see is some restraint on spending some tax policy set the policy, get out of the way, and let us do our job. And let the economy come back and stop doing this piecemeal and, and a little bit of time, a little bit of time, and not allowing us to make long-term decisions. I think, I think what's missing in the, in the bureaucratic world or in the government world is when you look at real estate and you look what we do. So, so just coming back, uh, just, just take Century City as a perfect example. Um, we bought Century City in 2002. We moved the theatre, we spent $150 million. We bought the building next door in uh, 2005 or so. We've been planning an expansion there where we're going to spend $600, $700 million. We have all the approvals from the city and by the time we start and finish, the mall will be fully finished and fully open in 2018, 2019. We started planning this back in 2005. That's 14 years. I'm dealing with developments now and I'm dealing with things um, that we're going to do that will open in 2020, 2021, 2022. How do you make five, 10, 15 year decisions when you've got a government that won't make a decision for the next six months? If you can't get stable policy, you can't get stable government and you can't get the ability to understand where they're going so you can make long-term investment decisions, how do you make those decisions? How do you actually deal with them? And so the argument I'm making is whether um, the tax rate is 15% of GDP or 19% of GDP, I don't care. Um, I only care in, in relation to the amount of expenditure. So if you look back at the US economy um, post-World War II, historically, we've, we've had 19% of GDP as taxation. We've spent 20 or 21% of GDP on the way through depending, you know, the Clinton years were a little different, straight after war was a little different. But those are the sort of numbers that we've been operating on. If we can get the federal government to agree on that sort of a, a, a plan, um, you know, that sort of a relationship of where you can actually spend what you raise and you can actually raise what you spend, then I can plan over 15 and 20 years. But with where we are now, it just makes it very difficult to do. Uh, also, when you look at consumer confidence, you're right, the consumer has re-equitized. Um, a lot of that has been uh, foreclosures and, and, and forced uh, sales of assets and, and people you know, basically going into bankruptcy. But the consumer themselves has, have increased the savings rates. They have uh, re-equitized themselves. Uh, in the US, I would say business and, and, and corporations have re-equitized themselves. So the system is re-equitizing. The only place where you haven't got any, any decrease in debt is the government. So the debt that was being borrowed by private enterprises is now being borrowed by the federal government. And at the moment, there's just no consensus on any way to make any reforms to change it. So, um, so let me ask you, based on this backdrop, where's the US economy headed? Saying all that, <laughs> I'm really bullish. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, but I am. Um, um, you've got to look at economies in relation to other economies. And, and part of my job, a big part of my job, is allocation of capital. Where do I allocate that capital? Where do I invest it? What returns do I get? And when you look around the globe, um, 
the, the US has a whole range of things going for it. Um, firstly, a deep belief that I have that no matter what problems we, f we create, we can actually fix them. And, and when you look at the US economy, it's so large that it is probably one of the few economies in the world that can actually change course and regenerate itself in a very short period of time. So just go back, um, uh, you know, big history buff, um, but you don't even have to go back that far. Just go back to the, to the 80s or go back to the um, uh, late 70s with President Carter when we had inflation and oil problems and huge debt. And then during the Reagan years when we doubled the amount of debt that the country had and we had deficits that were going from now to beyond imagination, we could never fix them. Then you get the 1994 budget deal, you get the 1996 budget with President Clinton. And lo and behold, within three years, the predictions of, which you may or may not remember, in 2009, the Government Accounting Office predicted if we keep going along this path, the complete and utter debt of the United States will be paid off by 2010. Okay. And the markets were wondering, what are we going to do? The United States stopped issuing 30-year debt in 1999 and late 1998 because of the surpluses, because of where we're going, and we had economic growth. And you project that growth out, you project the, the surpluses out, and our $3 trillion worth of debt would have been zero. But that repaired almost 20 years of inflation, high interest rates, deficits, deficit spending, oil shocks, and, and that repair happened in a four-year period. So um, the Australian foreign, talk about Australia, the Australian foreign minister was here two or three years ago and basically argued the US economy was one budget deal away from being fixed. It's still the same today, one budget deal away from being fixed. So if we get some sort of, some sort of stable policy, the growth and the pent-up growth here in the US um, will we'll actually take care of it. But we're stuck in this, in this cycle at the moment of uh, relying on government, relying on uh, low interest rates to, to create uh, asset price inflation, um, relying on the Federal Reserve. I mean, I, I, I've never done business where what the, what the chairman of the Federal Reserve says is going to determine my returns. I just, and, and I've just never seen it before. Well, uh, do you think, uh, what's your outlook on the strength of the dollar? Um, well? I'm, I'm bullish on the dollar, I'm bullish on the country. I think, I think there's a couple of things coming that, that everybody misses, and, and you mentioned it. And, and while it's outside the real estate realm, I spend a lot of time looking at these economies. I spend a lot of time looking at where we can allocate capital. Um, and, and, and when I look back at the 90s, actually, one of the things that, that helped really helped was the uh, internet and the adoption of the internet in the US and just have a look at the increases in productivity during the 90s. That actually saved us and helped uh, increase um, uh, economic growth substantially. I see um, the uh, energy revolution that's happening here in the US and fracking exactly the same way. Um, by 2020 we will be fully energy self-sufficient. Um, we'll be producing double in, in, in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Will be the oil output will have doubled from uh, 2012 to 2020. We'll be producing more oil ba oil barrel of oil equivalents um, than I think the whole of the Middle East or Saudi Arabia, one or the other. Um, when I see that, I see a complete change in the country, and you see it now. You see manufacturing coming back. You see the cheap gas prices that are happening, you just start to see all the wheels turning. Again, though, that depends on how the federal government decides to deal with this. Issues like the Keystone Oil Pipeline are actually fundamental to the economic growth of the country ten, in five, seven, ten years' time. Um, when you look at, at, at the, the future of the country, if we harness this, I think I'm bullish on the dollar and I'm very bullish on the economy. How much time do you have there? What do we have? I don't know. I'm not minutes? carrying a watch. So, okay. My last lawyer minutes, took good. it. Okay, so. I know you got plenty of stuff here. Um, so I, I want to get, you, you touched on the uh, notion of the internet and you're bullish on the internet and where it's going. I'm bullish people, on the country. I didn't say well, I was bullish well, on the internet. Well, you're saying that it's transforming everything. You're right. You're right. Don't uh, uh, take that off of Emma. Um, the, the, the question that I have for you is, is the internet really the threat 
to the bricks and mortar retail. We've talked about this before. It's playing out. You're seeing rapid expansion of people going into, I mean, real estate's being transformed by just changes in same day delivery by the online competitors that, that folks have. Um, where are you seeing all of this going and how are you playing into this in the future? I know you're, you're frustrated by this question. But no, it doesn't bother me anymore. I okay. used to be frustrated. Yeah, okay, all right. You look very comfortable, by the well, way. I am. Yeah, in, you know. in 1999, Jeff Bezos was on the cover of Time magazine declaring the death of the mall. It's 2013 and we're still here. Um, malls are still working and malls are still um, doing well. The internet and it has totally changed too in that time period. And there's a whole range of things happening. And I, I, this is actually uh, indicative of what's happening in the country. But you know, five years ago, the internet retailer had somebody sitting at their uh, a computer at home at three o'clock in the morning shopping because they had nothing else to do. And then came mobile. Then came that telephone. It's not a phone. Then came that computer that you carry in your pocket. And everything is moving away from, uh, away from sitting at your computer to mobile applications. What are you going to do with your phone? What are you going to do with your tablet? How are you going to operate in a mall? Where do you go? Interestingly enough, the internet itself saved our business. Um, two things happened. 70% of our customers who come to our malls search the product before they come. 70% of the customers search the product before they come. What we're finding from our retailers is if they can sell something to a customer on the internet and draw them into the store, they buy three times as much in the store as they buy on the internet. The, the other thing that's um, changing is that the retailers themselves are adapting to, to servicing their customer through multiple channels. And What's actually happening is the retailers have figured out, and, and I think this is the way the internet and mobile has, has really affected our business, has have figured out they don't need as many stores. They just don't need as many stores. And, uh, and I was at a, I tell this story all the time, but I was at a conference in Holland about two or three years ago. And they tend to be not as polite as yourselves, the Dutch, they tend to be very direct, even more direct than Australians. I saw a gold member. Uh, and this one guy was pounding the table and pounding the table <clears throat> that the internet is going to kill the mall business. And the internet's going to kill it and it's going to do this. And he, he sticks his finger at my face. He goes, one third of the malls in America are going to go down. What are you going to do about it? So I looked at him and I looked at the people and I looked at him and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invest in the other two thirds. <laughs> I was being facetious, but I was being actually serious. I was being very serious. We, we are building these mega assets uh, around the globe. Um, um, we've done it in London. We've done it in Stratford. We've done two in London. We're going to do that with uh, Century City here. Um, we've done it in San Francisco. Uh, we've done it in New Jersey. Um, and, and what happens is the retailers are building bigger and bigger stores and more flagship stores. And, and, and I, was, I, I do these conferences all the time. I was at, at one with uh, Philip Green from Topshop. And, and it twigged when he was talking, because you see this, but we, we built this mall right next to the Olympic Stadium, if anybody was there. It's an incredible um, asset. But Topshop built a, a very large store, 25,000, 30,000 foot store, and it does huge volume. And, and Philip was saying how great the store was, how good it is, how much profit he makes out of it, how it's great volume. He said, but when he opens that store, he closes six other stores. Because he does more volume out of the one than he does out of the six. He employs less people, he makes better profit, uh, hence we can charge more rent. Um, and his margins are all better all along. And he can close these six other stores in the surrounding area because if the customer doesn't come to his store at the mall, they'll shop on his website so that he doesn't actually lose sales. He actually gets net more sales. So when you apply that to what retailers are doing and you come back to the US, you see that happening everywhere. You see the gap um, saying they don't need as many stores as they used to have. Now, I can't remember how many stores they had, so don't quote me on this, but 
what used to happen is the Gap would open one store, and then they'd open, they'd grow from one store to 3,000 stores, so they could cover every market in the country. Then they would create another brand, which would be Gap Kids, one store, 3,000 stores. Then they'd have Baby Gap, same sort of thing. Then they did Old Navy, and it was a bigger format, so they went to 1,500 stores. When you listen to them now, they don't need 3,000 stores. They're coming, cutting back to 1,500 stores. When the European retailers come to the US and you see Zara and H&M, Uniqlo, they're, going, they're only going to open 150 or 200 stores. So what's happened is that the retailers have worked out that they can have less stores and still not give up sales by covering their market through their websites. And for us, what that leads us to is investing in the other two thirds, literally. So what happens is when you have a mall that is affected by this and you have, a mar you, you have retailers whose stores are marginal, so they're making marginal profit. So that means it's sort of on the edge whether they make enough profit to keep the store open or not. Um, what you need to do is you need to spend more capital on that mall so that when the lease comes up, you give the retailer capital, you charge them rent, so in essence their, their cost of real estate goes down. So you entice them to stay at these marginal assets because the store's marginal to them. They can let it go or they can keep it. What happens then is those assets, long-term returns, are challenged. Not because of the income, not because they're bad, because their returns have to go down because you have to keep spending more capital on keeping the retailers. So what happens is the, the developers or the landlords buy income growth. So you keep giving capital to the retailer. You, uh, the, retail, the net operating income of the malls go up, but you're spending capital to keep that net operating income going up. So what happens to that? Your internal rate of return over a 10-year period go down. So what we're doing is we are actually selling what we call non-core assets. We're selling a whole range of assets like this to other buyers because we see those long-term returns challenged. Now, they're not challenged today. They're not going to be challenged tomorrow. But we see in 5, 10, 15 years that happening more and more and more. So what we're doing is we're selling those assets. That's the, the Starwood Capital right. that was just done. And, and we take that capital and we reinvest it back in major assets. So at the moment, I've, in the US, I've sold uh, about $3 billion worth of assets in the last two or three years. Um, but then we bought uh, 50, half of the World Trade Center, which right. is $700 million. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're investing six or seven hundred million dollars in in Century City. We're investing uh, four hundred million dollars up in Valley Fair. We just did UTC in San Diego. So what we're doing is we're selling marginal assets and we're taking that capital, reinvesting it in in major developments, or we're reinvesting it in the UK where we're building major assets, or in Milan where we're going to do a development. Um, and we actually have excess capital, so we bought back some two point three billion dollars worth of stock in the last eighteen months. So. When you look at the internet itself, and, and you look where the consumers are, you look at the recession, we actually think the recession has totally changed the nature of the way consumers shop. And, uh, and has led to, and, and with the internet, has led to this change in the retailer. So we are actually changing the nature of our portfolio. And uh, so are you using leverage at all? No. <laughs> it's, 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 it's such a conundrum. I mean, we're in such an odd position. We have excess equity, so we're buying back stock. When, when I started working, I started, the first time I started was 1983. I have to go back and have a look at what interest rates were, but I'll bet you in Australia they were eight or eight and a half percent, I'll bet you. Um, and then when I was working, they went all the way up to 14 or 15 or 16. And now I'm sitting here and they're zero, oh, okay, four. Um, and we just can't use the money, so we're just not leveraging up. Um, I do say this though, although I've said this for two years, and I'm always wrong, by the way, when I do this, because I, I come to the game really early. I was very bullish on the US in 2010, took a while to catch up. Um, I was very nervous in 2007, took a while to um, go down. So I tend to be wrong for a whole range of years. But if, I'll tell you something about real estate especially. If you hang around long enough, 
and you have enough equity, sooner or later you're going to be right. Because the market will come to you. I mean, I've done this for so long, guys, that the market comes to you. And when they come to you, people say, geez, you were a genius. You figured this out. I was only wrong five years in a row. I, you know, I mean, um, but, but I look at these interest rates. And, and interestingly enough, I value the companies differently than the market. I value our business differently. I do not value um, the assets or the operating companies today on today's interest rates. I normalize out interest rates over a really long period of time. Um, and, and I just can't believe that, uh, so that, kind of that these, these will stay. Today? Well, if I look at, at, at us, our average cost of debt over 30 years has been around 6%. Okay? Our average cost of debt today is 4 I operate as if it's 6 I, You know, I just, we are extending maturities. We are doing everything we can do. We won't leverage up because we can't use the money. And I just work in a more conservative style world. That the problem with that, though, is that had you sat here 12 months ago, everyone would have told you, every economist, everybody at the school would have told you that interest rates will be more normalized 12 months out. And I sit in a world where I'm, I, I've got lots of information. I, I can show you analysis from, uh, uh, on, on interest rates that will say we have these interest rates all the way through the end of the decade. Now, I don't believe it. I don't operate that way. But I can believe the scenario that that could happen. We could get stuck in 1% or 2% GDP growth. We could get stuck with very uh, small increases in unemployment or unemployment going down because people are dropping out of the workforce. We could be stuck in this environment for a while. The longer we're stuck in this environment, the longer we're going to have um, zero interest rates. I mean, I can borrow, I can borrow 10-year money now at 375. It's insane. I used to have a spread of 375, by the way. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about uh, other equity that's chasing deals. What are you seeing in terms of foreign investment in the United States? Um, George W. Bush has one of my favorite quotes. He said, uh, more and more of our imports are coming from overseas. <laughs> and, and capital, I believe, is one of those imports these days. There's so much money chasing. Are people chasing you to put money to work? Are, are joint venture partners coming to you, equity sources? Um, I've been saying this since 2008, and particularly during the financial crisis. Um, the, US, uh, the US institutions have basically pulled out of the real estate markets. Um, uh, teachers is buying, but the standard guys we used to use are just not in there. I mean, CalPERS was the largest owner of real estate in the United States. Now, I don't know for sure, but I don't think they've bought a piece of real estate in the last three or four years. Um, there is major capital coming out of the rest of the world. The sovereign wealth funds, which is a brand new form of uh, capital over the last five or ten years, are just brimming with money. Um, and it comes from sources that you would be surprised about. At the moment, the largest, invest, the largest foreign investor in US real estate is Canada. Okay. Every man and his dog. I'm sure you guys are doing this too. Going up to see CPP, going up to see um, Ivanhoe, going up to see uh, uh, the Mounties. What are they called? PSP? Um, PSP. 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 Um, it comes from Canada, Singapore, Australia, uh, Korea. The, the standard guys have been here for a long time. The Dutch still have plenty of capital, the Germans, and the Norwegians. I mean, you look at, uh, just, just, you look at Norges, uh, the Norges Fund. I might get this wrong too, but they have something like $680 billion, something like this. They earn $20 million a day or a week, one or the other, it doesn't matter actually. Um, and they have zero allocated to global real estate. They now have a mandate to go to 5%, and that mandate's going to grow. With a very small team over a period of time, they have to deploy $30 billion in real estate. I'm starting a charter to go to Norway for anybody um, here. Everybody goes to Norway. You wouldn't be the first. You'll have to take a ticket, have wow. to take a number. Um, and so the problem is um, that's, being, um, that's being compounded right across the globe. The interesting thing is that capital is only going to the top class of assets. It's not going to the B and C assets. It's, it's, you, you're not getting joint venture money from overseas to go to, no offense to anybody in the room, Cleveland or to uh, Minneapolis. They will go to New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, um, Dallas, San Francisco. 
They will go to the top tier of the office building business. They will go to the top tier of the mall business, but they're not really looking at secondary assets. That hasn't happened yet. But that capital has been around ever since it thought it would earn 20% returns in 2009 because all the real estate was, everyone was gonna go broke, it was gonna be 1994 again, and everybody was gonna be out, was, was in need of capital, they get really good assets at very cheap prices, and it just never happened. So that capital is still sloshing around and hasn't got a home yet. Hmm. Sooner or later, it has to be deployed somewhere. And then, do you think rates, uh, or cap rates, are gonna be pushed to further rational uh, points? In the the, thing, the thing that, I'll, I'll give you another point of which everyone tells me I'm wrong on, and, and plenty of times I am, and plenty of times I'm not on this one. Cap rates and interest rates have no correlation. Okay? That's over a 20 or 30 year period or a 10 year period. If you look at it over the last 12 months or the last 18 months, they are totally correlated, or the last two years. Um, but if you look over a very, very long period of time, they're not. I believe that cap rates are actually uh, determined by uh, the total rate of return needed by institutional investors. The REITs are owned by institutional investors. The assets themselves, the direct investors, are institutional investors. And when the total return criteria of institu institutions comes down, cap rates go up. Uh, if you go back four or five years ago, institutional total returns were somewhere around nine or ten percent. So if you have three percent growth, your mall's got a six cap rate. It, it, it's not rocket science. Even lawyers can do this math, okay? It's not <laughs> rocket science. I have an issue with lawyers and math, okay? I have this issue. Just ask my, uh, my corporate counsel. Um, um, but what's happened is that, that globally, doesn't matter what currency, by the way, the global institutions, they've also become global like everybody else, their return criteria has dropped from nine to 10% to six to 7%. So if you want a 2% growth, you got 5% cap rates. Then depending on what leverage they agree to and what their total return is, um, these low interest rates over a long period of time have changed the total return criteria of institutions and that's led to cap rates. What I actually see happening is that as and when interest rates start increasing, um, if the economy starts increasing with it, you'll have net operating income growth but what will happen is that the return criteria will change, cap rates will move up a bit, but values won't go down. Hmm. So you're gonna get this thing where I actually think the values are quite stable, gross values are quite stable from here for quite a period of time. Thanks. Um, in June of 2013, you gave the, this is kind of the last question I'm gonna ask you, um, going back to something which is, again, more personal. Um, but you gave the, the keynote at UCLA's um, MBA commencement, and you advocated the creation of positive legacies by future business leaders. And you asked the audience, what legacy do you want to leave future generations? Um, you said, how prepared are you to use your talents to shape and change your life? And you said, not only that, but that of your family, your immediate community, the nation, or even the world. So Peter, what's the legacy that you want to leave? How do you want to be <laughs> left in the next I'm 30 years? I'm gonna, I've got five minutes, so I'll, I'll give you the story of how that came about. Um, as I said, I read quite a lot of stuff, uh, a little less at the moment because we're so busy, but, but I got struck by this, this thought of how can you affect something 100 years hence? Now, not all of us are J.P. Morgan, even though his guys are under pressure a bit. Um, nice thon. He was probably under pressure at his time, too. Um, and how do you actually affect this? And, and, and it just struck me out of the blue. I was reading a book on the, on the Cuba Missile Crisis. And, and I think it was uh, Secretary McNamara, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, the way, the way it was he, was, he was 60 years old at the time, 60-something years old. No, 54, my age. He was 54 years old at the time. He was born in 1909 or 1910. His grandfather fought in the Civil War. And, and President Kennedy at the time was, was trying to get advice from his cabinet as to whether he should attack Cuba or not. And that if you attack Cuba, you create presumably nuclear war with the Russians, and everything flows from that. And, and what, in the book, what, what Secretary McNamara had on his mind was his grandfather. 
And he said, how can I sit here in 1963 and have to contemplate nuclear war where my whole thought process is grounded in my grandfather from the Civil War? That's 100 years hence. His grandfather affected his decisions on nuclear war in 1963, back from 1860 to 1865. So that started me thinking, which is always a problem for me. Um, and then I came across another story just quickly, because I only got two or three minutes. Um, I was in London, and it's the 100th anniversary next year of the First World War, which people probably forget about. But there's a, a gentleman who's the head of a, a commission that's, uh, they're doing a whole range of things. Um, to celebrate, the wrong word, but celebrate or remember the anniversary of the war. Uh, Lord Rothermere, uh, he's, he's actually in his 40s. Uh, he is the third Lord Rothermere. His grandfather was one of three, um, one of three sons. Two of them died in the First World War, and there's a whole range of letters there. And, and at the function that I was at, the Lord Rothermere of today got up and spoke about his uncles as if they were alive today, as if they affected him today, as if it affected his thought process today. So even though his two uncles were dead from the war, his father became Lord Rothermere because his two brothers died. It affected the way he thinks. It affected how he operates. He too was affected a hundred years hence. So of course this keeps me thinking and now I have to go make this speech. I, I, I think the answer to that is, well, I've got one minute now. Um, I've stretched this long enough so I don't have to give you the full answer. Um, the answer for me is I don't actually, I can't tell you what the legacy I want to leave. That's not what I do. I have a whole range of things that I do. I mean, you, you, you talk about my, uh, my uh, resume. I get tired when I listen to it, let alone do it. Um, I have a whole range of people who work with me. I, I, I'm in a very privileged position. You know, I've got a big company. I've got a big um, staff. I've got people who help me out everywhere. But uh, there's more to Westfield and there's more to us than just building buildings and building malls. And, and what I try to say at, um, at uh, UCLA is no matter how successful uh, the kids are and no matter how much money they make, their grandchildren won't remember their business career. Won't mean anything to them. They'll remember what they did in life. They'll remember what they told them in life. They'll remember how they acted what they did when the chips were down, who they worked with, how they helped, and what they tried to create. And for me, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do, and my kids will determine that. Um, uh, with a bit of luck, uh, uh, my kids will have kids who will then learn that from my wife and I. Um, we, we didn't have that privilege because of the war, although my mother's um, parents were around. Um, and that's how you affect 100 years hence. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.